series related to the uh, digitalization of smart energy systems. I'm Thomas Strasser. Uh, I'm uh, organizing uh, this training series together with my colleagues, uh, the colleagues uh, from the Institute Mihail Pupin. Um, we will uh, record the meeting, uh, as said. Uh, we will share all the recordings and the slides uh, later on with you. Uh, you can ask questions uh, directly in the chat. Please do that uh, during the, uh, the talks of uh, uh, Kathleen and uh, Dennis. Uh, we will uh, uh, probably interrupt them and uh, if the questions directly relates to one of the uh, presentation points. Um, we have also probably some time at the end of the lecture to answer additional questions. Uh, feel free uh, to ask um, in the wider chat. Uh, this uh, training uh, series is organized by three European projects, the IRIGRID project, the Synergy and the Resiliate project, funded uh, by the Horizon 2020 uh, framework program and the Smart Energy Systems uh, Aeronet. Uh, as said, this is the last part uh, of our lecture series. Uh, so we are finalizing the uh, lecture series today with a talk from my colleague Kathleen Gaviluta and Dennis Vettoretti. Uh, both are from the uh, Austrian Institute of Technology, AIT. And the topic of uh, the talk today, uh, the lecture, is on the cyber physical test beds for validation of large scale smart grid uh, apps. And uh, it's time to hand over to uh, Kathleen and uh, Dennis. Okay. okay. Uh, thank, thank Thomas for the introduction. Um, I'll just try to share share my screen. And hey, still there? Uh, hopefully everything still works as intended. Are we good? I, I hope you can see the presentation. Yes. Okay. Perfect. Let's go ahead. Okay. Perfect. Okay. So once again, thanks so much for the introduction and thanks to everyone who decided to join to today. Um, we have today we have like probably like a one hour and a half presentation split between uh, myself and Dennis. As Thomas said, we are both uh, researchers at the Austrian Institute of Technology. And some of the topics that, uh, let's say, that both Dennis and I are passionate about is how we can uh, test uh, large scale smart grid applications and how can we achieve this with the tools that we have around our lab. Um, so today, uh, the presentation, this is a presentation that uh, we did before and it was a one hour presentation, so it was nicely split in half. And now I extended a bit into uh, Dennis's part and Dennis extended a bit the demo that he wanted uh, will show you. So uh, to make it uh, interesting for, for today, so a bit what you can expect. Uh, I'm going to talk a bit about uh, introduction, motivation, why we think this uh, this uh, topic is interesting and worth looking at. Uh, then I'm going to show you a bit of our trajectory here at AIT, uh, the approaches that we've been using and where we are heading. And then uh, I'm going to open the hood and look a bit behind the, the scenes of our tools, but just a bit, and then I'm going to hand over to Dennis, and then he's going to give you like the full tour. Um, at the end, we'll yeah, like uh, I think Thomas will open the the, the session for questions, so we, hopefully we can have some discussions at the end if if there are uh, questions. Um, so a bit of uh, introduction and motivation why we are doing this. So. I guess everybody by now is familiar about this uh, very ambitious goals of reaching carbon neutrality by 2050, at least here in the EU, but uh, also around the globe, there is this ten tendency to reduce green gas and uh, uh, move as much as possible to a carbon neutral approach. Um, as a consequence, what this means uh, is that a lot of the demand sectors are expected to transition towards electricity, and we're seeing this already in uh, the sectors like transport and heating. Um, and at the same time, there is this increase in renewable energy demand, so also contributing to this uh, carbon neutrality. So uh, the goal is around 80%, at least for the, according to the European Green Deal, 80% renewable uh, generation by 2050. So we have these two aspects, 
that are a bit, uh, let's say, opposing. Uh, on the one hand, we have increased demand, and on the other hand, we have more intermittent uh, renewable genera generation to fulfill this demand. So what we are seeing as a consequence is we're seeing uh, more and more like the need for higher flexibility. So there are a few reports coming up that uh, show like, uh, the, um, that the demand for flexibility, so to use the load to match the uh, the difference in production, will uh, grow seven times by 2050. Um, also, there is another report from the um, uh, uh, NTEC on digitalization of energy flexibility, and then here they are identifying digitally enabled flexibility as one of the players in the energy transition. So here on the right, uh, there's a snippet I took from this uh, report, if you can see my pointer. So here they identify def different use cases uh, according to their maturity level. So here on the right, we have like how mature this technology is, and they are looking at things like vehicle to grid, uh, energy communities, virtual power plants, and so on. And on the vertical axis is their uh, the size of this technology or how big this technology is expected to be. So some of these, the projections from this report by for 2050 is that, for example, 59 million EVs will use smart charging, and a large part of this will be involved in vehicle to grid schemes. And also 60% of the renewable genera uh, uh, generation will be aggregated into virtual power plants. So from us, what we're seeing, so I didn't mention, but we're coming a bit from, let's say, from the digitalization perspective on at this problem. So when we are seeing this, we're seeing, okay, this is massively distributed software applications that are going to be scattered all across the, let's say, the map, uh, and they interact with the critical uh, energy supply infrastructure. And this comes with a whole lot of problems. How do we investigate these systems? How do we test and validate before we deploy such a, let's say, uh, distributed uh, application into the system? And how, overall, how do we deal with the let's say, cyber physical nature of this uh, systems at scale. So this is uh, something that we are concerned on. And then we started to look, OK, what are we look how what are the approaches that we're using and what's the state of the art when we are looking at testing modern system power components? So, for example, an inverter like the one here. So these are very complex cross-domain systems. They have power hardware inside, so some power electronics. They have control hardware. Uh, they have complex control structures to con con control uh, all of this uh, hardware. There is embedded software. There is embedded communication. So it's a quite complex piece of technology. And to test this complex piece of technology, we came up with, let's say, a lot of different approaches. Uh, varying in complexity, but also on the cost. But as you approach, let's say, uh, the right-hand side, also the test coverage and what you actually can validate from your uh, test, from your system, uh, so the accuracy of your test and uh, uh, grows. So, so here, at the very bottom, we have offline simulation. This validates maybe just like the core idea of what you're like, maybe a control algorithm or like some very small percentage of what your final product is. And then we came up like in now it's become it's state of the art already. We have this controller hardware in the, where you take your controller hardware, you connect it to these real time simulators, and now you test the entire software stack. So not just the controller the idea of the controller, but the actual implementation and the hardware on which is going to run. Then you can go a step further, you do power hardware in the loop, where now you also test your power hardware, and so on and so forth, until in the end you go into the field test. Uh, so this is state of the art, so we know very well how to test one component, but we don't know very well how to test multiple components. So. This is one inverter that we know very well how to test, but modern power systems, I would argue, they are distributed systems. So you have tens, hundreds of these devices everywhere that consist of network components, 
uh, they consist of uh, distributed computing resources and communication. Once you start adding communication, all of this becomes a network system that can implement so complex software architecture, distributed and hierarchical control with multiple pieces uh, interacting between them and running together. So the question is, how do we test this? So our, let's say, mission or vision is like, we want for a first step to come with something that can cover this part, which would be the equivalent of controller hardware in the loop, or maybe system in the loop, or whatever you want to call it, but something that takes us a step further than just pure offline. In this case, probably it would be co-simulation. So, so what what can we do to uh, achieve like a greater test coverage for these distributed systems? So. There are no proper off-the-shelf tools for handling this sort of validation scenarios, as maybe you are well aware. Um, and this is something that we've been trying to, to research and solve to some extent. So it started, um, for me, it started before I joined the IT, but after I joined the IT, we continued this work in a project called Largo. And here we were working at, uh, we were looking at software, uh, software deployment and how we can deploy software uh, into the grid. Uh, and uh, it also had like some security, uh, cybersecurity aspects related to it. And it, it was a very interesting project, but in the end, like we ended up with, let's say this uh, stack that you can see here on the left, where we had the physical layer at the bottom, we had an application layer. So these are all the different software components running connected to the grid. And then we had like the security layer monitoring this, all of these applications. So to approach this task, so for in Largo, we had the following approach. We modeled this uh, uh, as a real time, so we had like a real time simulation of the physical layer running on the Opal RT. Then we put together uh, a rack filled with Raspberry Pis on which we deployed all of these uh, devices. We had uh, some middle layer developed here uh, at AIT called Lablink that uh, provided the interface between the uh, real time simulation running in the on the physical for the physical layer and the software running on the Raspberry Pi, so basically providing this connection here. Uh, and then here for the security layer, we also deployed it on the same. And then we had communication in between. So we created like a laboratory setup uh, around this real-time digital simulator to be able to address this use case. And this worked for Largo as it was like a small use case, as you can see in the picture, uh, but it involved a lot of manual setup. So every step here in this process, it was uh, me or later on Dennis in the loop, modeling, uh, programming, uh, configuring the interfaces. And every time there was a change, we would have to, again, change in a bunch of places and there will always be errors and problems. So we thought that there has to be a better way to, to do this and maybe also a scalable way. So. We learned some lessons from Largo, which basically the main message was, okay, the system level validation thing is not an easy task. So there is, and the main complexity comes from configuring and coordinating this, uh, these uh, setups as the number of components grow. So as I said, the scalability of th this approach was also limited as we had like a limited through throughput through lab link. We had only 20 Raspberry Pis in this rack and a lot of manual processes in the modeling, interface definition, scenario execution, and so on. So we thought that, hey, if we want to push this scenario, so maybe let's say with the Largo approach, we can go, go to maybe a hundred controllers in the loop or something like this. But if we want to push it to thousands, to really large scale scenarios that could cover maybe modern approaches, IoT sort of scenario, we need a different approach. So we started to look into automatization, basically trying to describe and configure all of our system from uh, through like a specified language. We started to look into model generation and interface generation virtualization, and then we try to streamline also the data exchange with the Opal RT. So at that time, sorry, 
just a bit of water. So we came up with this approach where we called it that time, that time like let's say like a long-term vision, like how do we imagine these things were going to run? And they were based something like we have like a way in which we can describe the entire system. It should be machine uh, writable, machine readable. We can, and then from this, we can generate our models and all of the interfaces in between. And from that one, we can deploy them on different, let's say, hardware that we would have around from real time simulators to servers to network emulators and so on. So, this was our vision in 2019. And since then, we've been little by little building on it. Uh, by 2021, when we were working on Posaico, uh, this is another project that we were involved with. We had this idea clear that, okay, we need to approach it as a service and we need to make these things available also to be used from the outside. So um, we we continue with this gen generic model description. So we had like these two services that can be uh, accessed from the World Wide Web interfacing to our laboratory infrastructure that allowed us uh, to uh, yeah to use this approach as a service but then the configuration of this setup we also try to make it as automatic as uh, possible so we use this uh, model description here so here you see that there are just a few project files you need to configure and from these ones you can then get the real-time simulation and your software running on our servers. Dennis, in the second part of the presentation, is going to show you a bit more of this, so it's going to maybe be uh, more clear what I'm talking about. But in the end, through with this uh, approach, uh, we have this online services that allowed, let's say, uh, simulation orchestration of our infrastructure. So you could uh, reserve simulation, uh, real-time simulator, you can execute the simulation pauses, you can monitor the signals as the simulation is running and so on. Then on the cyber layer, you could deploy your software as containers on our servers. And then you can also run predefined tests and uh, and uh, yeah, record data and explore the results. So with this approach in Posaico, so yeah, these are some screenshots of yeah, how this platform looks on, on online. So these are the real-time simulators that you can reserve. This is one of the use cases that we were working on in Posaico. Actually, this use case to be more precise, which was on, um, coordinating local elect, uh, electric uh, vehicles, so the charging of electric vehicles to avoid the uh, congestion in the grid. So the, set, the scenario that we were looking, you had uh, a central controller monitoring the loading on the different buses, and then you have uh, electric vehicles, and these electric vehicles each have their own local controller that communicates with the central controller. Um, and uh, yeah, they coordinate uh, in order to to try to avoid uh, the overloading of the cables while at the same time uh, uh, satisfying the charging demands of the of the users. So in this use case, there were in a, uh, a total of eighty seven local controllers and uh, one central controller. So we had eighty eight controllers in the loop with our simulation uh, running running together. So where are we trying to move with this? So there are several use cases that we are currently addressing and we had the interesting conversation with interested parties. So one is to have uh, this set up as um, training rooms for network operating training. So where we can easily set up these things and then have it as like some sort of operator uh, trainer. Um, then there is the use case that we are going, to, uh, that we are discussing today as a, this sandbox for evaluating complex software ecosystem and algorithms. Here we already had uh, several users and interested parties also from universities, but also from the industry side. And then the final one is on cyber physical ranges. This is also a task that uh, we are um, addressing in this in the, the project uh, Resiliate uh, that um, 
and it's on uh, cyber physical ranges. This is together with our colleagues from digital safety and security. And the goal is to couple this infrastructure or like this approach that we have with their uh, with their cyber range to obtain the cyber physical range. So. As I said, today we are focused on the middle one, so smart grid application and validation. And just to give you an idea of how we uh, envision this, and then later on, Dennis will also show you the example that uh, uh, that uh, we have on this. So we are seeing it uh, in the following way. So let's say some external partner in Resiliate, we are collaborating with the colleagues from Fraunhofer. They are developing some controller, some application. This is a complex application with multiple modules here. I called it Greek controller 1.0. And at some point they want to release a new version. It's version 2.0. And before they deploy it to the field, they want to test it or to what they want to test it as accurately as possible. So how does the workflow or the interaction works? So first they need to package their uh, software the same way they would normally do. So they the different modules, they become like the soft, software stack that we are testing. But together with this, they also prepare like two additional files. One is the experiment design and one is the test design. And once all of these files are ready, they just trigger our infrastructure. So once the infrastructure is triggered, everything else happens automatically and without any interaction from the external partner. So what happens is from the experiment design, uh, the experiment manager sets up the scenario. So it stages the scenario. So it loads a model of the grid it deploys the different software at the locations of the grid specified in the experiment design, and it configures all of the data interfaces between this, these modules and, and the grid and between the modules themselves. So once this is done, then the test manager runs the test and to run the test, it needs to allocate resources on our infrastructure. So that means reserving real-time simulator, reserving servers to allocate uh, to yeah, the reserving servers to deploy all of the, let's say the containers that need to run here. And then it runs the test, it records the data, it uh, generates the reports, and then it pushes the data back into the repository of the external partner. So like this, the next day, or depending on the test duration, the, 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 the developer can see if like this thing, uh, yeah, works as he is expecting to work or if the tests are failed or passed. So this is more or less, let's say, the overall view. Uh, and then I'm going to show you a bit of under the hood, uh, how we how we achieve this and what we are currently working on. So. So when we we are developing this or like working on this, we had like several let's say, requests on how we envision the system to, to work with. So first, like, it should be modular. So different modules. Uh, so software nowadays is, I would say, in most of the scenarios, especially this distributed sort of application is in a microservices sort of uh, architecture. So we wanted to be able to address this sort of um, application. And then we want it to be uh, reusable. So uh, to have it in a, such a way that the code that we test here in simulation is as close as possible to what you would test in the field. So this would be the same principle as in this controller hardware in the loop. So the same controller that you test close to your real-time simulation, then you take and you plug it in the system and it uh, works the same. Then of course we want it to be uh, language agnostic, scalable, very important. We wanted to have uh, uh, the to be able to test large systems and we want it to be interoperable so we can interact with the system as a as a service and to have it exchange information with other systems as well so in the end if you look from let's say a bird's eye view not much has changed from largo let's say we're still using the physical layer to run it on the opal rt and now for the application layer, instead of running it on Raspberry Pis, we 
moved to Docker and we're running Docker containers and servers. So at the high level overview, there is not much change, but behind there is a lot of effort that went into trying to make this automatic and seamless and to avoid as much as possible the the Dennis and the Catalin in the loop configuring everything. So to make it as as streamlined as possible. Here with the asterisk or with the parentheses as possible and as much the the current tools allows us. So um so one one piece of the puzzle that we had to solve is like how do we how we exchange data with Apollo RT in let's say a streamlined uh, manner and in a scalable manner. So I don't know if between the people on the call, if they had to exchange digital data with Opal RT, probably they will use an approach like we used for labeling. So this is the following. You have your simulation. You collect the signals that you want to send out of your simulation. You use this uh, async TCP UDP block that Opal RT provides in their toolbox. And then all of this runs on the Opal RT. And then you have to decode this. So, so then you have to have a receiver that receives this file, you uh, packets, decodes them, and typically you wrap them around something nicer than UDP. So in our case, we, we use the MQTT for labeling, and then to the signals that you received, you, you, you want to add um, uh, some, some sort of uh, metadata, um can you still hear me so i think my my internet yes. connection glitched for a bit okay no, sorry. everything looks good okay, for, at least on my side okay um so uh so yeah here again you want to add the the metadata of your signals uh, uh and then then in the case of MQTT, you push them to an MQTT, you publish them to an MQTT broker, and then finally an external process, your software application or your controller can subscribe to that specific channel to get information from the grid. So you would follow this sort of approach. So this is also what we, we used in with uh, our lab link adapter for, for the Opal RT. So, there are several issues uh, with uh, this. So for to begin with is if you make the mistake that you forget to a signal or at some point later on you decide, oh, it will be good to have also the current here from this node exactly after the voltage or something like that. Then you need to change this, but then you need to change everything in between. So uh, suddenly all the bits in your packet have shifted a bit, then you need to change the decoder, then you need to change the uh, the wrapper. So you need to change in several places, and this increases the chances of you making a, a mistake. Um, uh, also, the signals are sent without any, let's say, identification or metadata. So once the signals uh, leave uh, the Opal RT simulation. Uh, here, when you receive them, you just receive like a stream of bits. So then you need to add again the metadata here in order to know what, what each signal means. So again, you make a mistake here. You just, maybe you delete a signal here, you add something else, and this is not current, but this angle or something else, and suddenly you get some unexpected behavior down the road. So, so adding this metadata once in your simulation here and once further down three, three blocks down the road was also something that we didn't like. And um, also since, there is no way to interact with the signal at a low level. We we had also quite high latencies when we were uh, we tested the performance of this approach. So in this case, we had I think uh, the 99 percentile was at 44 uh, milliseconds. So for this one, I think we are sending 1,000 signals out of the Opal RT. Um, so there were like a few things that we thought that uh, can be can be improved. Um, so 
some of the requests that we had. So we wanted the signals to be available to the external processes after we rebuild the, Opal, uh, the model on the Opal RD. So once I rebuild the model, I want the signals to be available and I want to have signal identification and metadata. So I know what what is. And then if possible, also to improve latency. So for this, we developed what we called internally ROA DB. So this this Redis Opal asynchronous data buffer. So there, this is like a process that runs in parallel with the real-time process on the, uh, with the real-time simulation on the Opal RT itself. And that uh, streams data to a Redis server that then uh, interfaces with the external processes. And this approach solved all or checked all the requirements. So basically now you just configure uh, the raw ADB through at the same time you configure your simulation. So it has like some input files that are that can be generated on measurements and commands. And once you rebuild the model, all of this is available outside to the ready server immediately. So you don't have to recompile, change your middle layer and so on. So automatically this uh, this is available so this is very easy to to configure it's similar to the async ip block but uh, working with uh, redis um and this also improved quite a bit since redis has like uh, quite quite good performance this improved quite a bit our uh, our throughput so here you see the performance again with 1000 signals and the 99 percentile i think it's around 17 milliseconds so an improvement of around uh, three three times uh, so Catherine, was, so, sorry for yeah. interrupting yeah. there was there is one question that they raised uh, um yeah, I, when you the chat, so. <laughs> uh, I read it when you say testing the control algorithm i'm guessing yeah. you mean some distribution network level coordination or orchestration type algorithm and not the power electronic level control it, exactly you? exactly i should have been uh, maybe more precise or like it's clear Sorry to. Uh, oh, I didn't expect it to be that far back. So yeah, this this sort of like applications here. So let's say typical uh, power electronics controllers, control loops uh, for currents, voltages, and so on are here. You're thinking about microsecond time step in the simulation, maybe below. So a few hundreds nanoseconds time steps. so you're very precise you need to sample very fast you need to interact with the system very fast and for this sort of things yeah like that's the approach that we have now uh it's you need to plug your control card to the analog interfaces of the simulators and this is the standard i would say state of the art approach so the observation is correct and it's good to underline it. The type of application that we are discussing here, and these are, let's say, secondary level controllers. So high level controllers, uh, it could be some coordination strategies. We had, uh, I think Dennis's use case will go on some agent based system. So there are a lot of the system and controllers that you see a lot of publications in recent years. So going on more on moving from one component on coordinating multiple components where maybe you interact with the system at the millisecond range. So you read measurements every 10 milliseconds or 20 milliseconds or second level. And but then you do high level optimization, communication and so on. Uh, so I hope that clarifies a bit the scope. Or a bit better the scope. So where was I? I think I was about to hand over to Dennis. But I had something else I wanted to say. Oh no. Yeah. Yep. There we go. So I guess it was the perfect time for an interruption. <laughs> yeah, Dennis, uh, it's all you now. Thank you a lot, Catalin. Let me share my screen now. Uh, be before we proceed, are there any other questions uh, related to the uh, uh, outline? Mod um, Kathleen uh, explained on the uh, testing. Uh, yeah, there's one, the PDF that you showed for latency. Is this is it standard or based on uh, your observations? Uh, our observations. So to get these, we we were sending 1,000 signals outside of Opal RT, and we monitor. I think uh, 20,000 samples of of this 
1,000 signals that we sent, and then we compile this because we are not aware of. Uh, so it can only be obtained by measuring because there are several components in 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 between. Another comment, not exactly a question, but comment here. I have used the same online approach framework with Pisa yeah. Kronos. That's from uh, Tala that uh, yeah. used yeah, our Tala. infrastructure. Yeah, yeah. Ta Tala was, was uh, with us uh, last year, if I'm not mistaken. Or no, well, it's 2024 already, so I think two years ago. Um, and uh, yeah, he they started using it first. Uh, uh, they started using it first remotely, so through through this uh, Kronos approach. Be, there were some uh, administrative complications, so uh, before arriving here, they were able to test from Pakistan to some extent some of their their uh, um, their algorithms, and then uh, Tala was here with us for uh, two or three weeks, where then we continue continue in the lab. <laughs> I can see his uh, message. Thank you, Tala. Yeah, it was nice. <laughs> Uh, any other questions, Thomas? Do you have experience with Typhoon? It is similar uh, software. <laughs> Let me know. <laughs> yeah, we 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 do have some experience with uh, Typhoon. I would argue that uh, yes, while both they are real time simulators, they um, I, I would start by saying none of the real time simulators on the market are really suitable for the sort of applications we are talking here. Uh, we went with the Opal RT because uh, it has this uh, shared memory interface and we were able to do this sort of things. If I'm not mistaken, if you want to do something like this with Typhoon, they have some API that allows you to interact with the system. And I think they are going, they are using XML RPC or something like that, some remote procedure calls where you can get some uh, messages from the Opal RT while it's running. Uh, but the issue is that the Opal RT is using FPGAs to run their system simulations, which is very good for, let's say, very power electronics oriented applications where you can switch very fast and most of the simulation runs on the FPGA. Uh, but then it's difficult to, to scale up. Yeah. So, so. I like comment from Tala. He mentions that Typhoon is not for large distribution yeah, systems. Yeah, developed. yeah. You, you, I think they have they have products and they are trying to move now more into microgrid. I think they have for a while now, move, moving into microgrid sort of scenarios and so on. But uh, since the FPGA is their main, let's say, compute unit, uh, that's going to be a limitation of uh, how much you can scale. So. So yeah, there is always this fast, uh, so uh, switching fast or like a small time step uh, uh, compared to uh, larger systems. Another uh, question, uh, yeah. what will you say about RTDS? I have to say, I, I haven't, uh, I don't have hands-on experience with the RTDS, uh, but uh, from what I know, uh, it, the RTDS has a bit of both. They also use FPGAs for uh, for uh, computation, but you can scale it up. But yeah, uh, I I I don't have experience with RTDS, so I don't know if they have some some specific uh, interfacing options for for uh, yeah for making these wrappers to get more digital signals in and out. So yeah. Can, can say exactly about RTDS. Yeah, they had also a change. They introduced uh, the Novos Core yeah. um, computing platform a couple of years ago, and I think that has uh, more uh, uh, possibilities. Probably the, the old one was more um, closed system, but they can share um, a publication. It's, it's now quite old, but that uh, summarized the main uh, real-time simulation systems uh, and uh, compared to the differences. It's not fully up to date, but I share the link here. It's an open access publication. Mm -hmm. Yeah, since, since we don't have an RTDS, so I cannot <laughs> I cannot say from the hands-on because like this, when you read the specs and yeah, like they all look very good, but uh, sometimes when you actually get your hands on the different tools, <laughs> uh, let's say experience my uh, uh, or the actual experience might differ from what's written in the in the marketing material.
if there is nothing else, Thomas, then I hand over to Dennis because I think I took a bite yep. of his time. Yep, I think we can handle over to, to Dennis now. No problem. Yeah, thanks, Thank you, Katalin. So let me share my screen. OK, let's start from the previous slide. OK, so I will continue describing the test bed automation that we have, and uh, I will focus on the model representation, uh, the interlayer communication, and the workflow that is required to set up a system level validation. And uh, as the last point, I will have a, a demo. Uh, that is uh, regarding an agent-based distributing optimization using the IEEE 123 bus system. The demo is uh, pre-recorded, so I will use a video to do that. Okay, so let me uh, continue um, with this diagram. So the vision that we have is to try to automatize as much as possible the process of um, of configuring and running a system level validation. For who is familiar with system level validation, um, configuring and setting up such a simulation, it's a really time consuming task and especially terror prone. So we try to minimize as possible um, the, uh, the configuration required by the user and um, we try to achieve that using the, uh, uh, the tools that we develop internally. So uh, there will be a first phase that is uh, a phase where we define and configure the, the system. So we will provide like the test configuration experiments, the, the data to record the grid model. And once we have uh, these configuration files, we can like provide this file as input to the Kronos uh, uh, framework, so our framework, and then uh, uh, based on this file, we will be able to fully represent uh, a system level validation and generate specific model, for example, for the real time simulator in this case of Palarty, and to automatically deploy the application on our AT server. Uh, and this is the phase of deployment. And uh, after we manage to deploy um, uh, the grid model plus uh, the um, controllers that the software under test, uh, we can execute a simulation, record some data, and then analyze the data offline as last uh, stage. So um, what is important uh, here is to properly understand how to model uh, uh, such a system because it's very complicated. So I will start with the modeling part of the physical layer. The physical layer for us is the one representing the grid model, so like the buses, lines, uh, loads, and so on. And there are different formats, format, formats available online. And most of them are proprietary format. For example, if we use Power Factory, Power Factory has a specific format. If we use NetPlan, uh, NetPlan has a specific format. So we don't want to stick to um, a proprietary format. And we decided to use the SIM format that is uh, SIM stands for Common Interface Model. Uh, this model, uh, this format was specifically developed for grid model exchange. So uh, we get a full representation of all the uh, equipment, but we can get also uh, power system state variables inside and uh, steady state hypothesis information. So we can really get a full representation of the model and uh, using the same uh, format, uh, uh, this is also supported by the ENSOE, so this is an advantage. And most of the tools like Power Factory or NetPlan can export a model uh, in the same format. So we decided to use that. Uh, but the, the problem is that the same format is uh, basically a bunch of XML files. And uh, we cannot easily uh, store this file in a database. We want to have a database to um, to store the representation of the system because it's then easy to query uh, the different components that are there 
and also because we can easily extend the model adding new components. And this is not really uh, a simple task if we use a file-based approach. So we um, extended the C model and we converted it uh, in the NGSILD format. This is the format supported by the Fireware community as well. And uh, basically, we can get a one-to-one -one mapping of the SIM format to the NGSILD format, but instead of having XML file, in this case, we can work with JSON files, so basically dictionary. And this can be easily then uh, stored in a database, but the NGSILD format itself is not enough for us because, for example, we need not only to represent the uh, physical layer, but also the application layer and the interlayer communication between the application layer where our controller is running and our and the physical layer where our grid is running. So we, we extended it a bit, but imagine that the final version that we use, so the AT format, let me call it like that, is basically 99% NGSILD, uh, it basically 99% compatible with the NGSILD format. So practically, how does it look like? Uh, we start from, uh, let's see if we can see my pointer here. We start from something uh, that looks like that. So it, this is an XML file and where we can get the full representation of uh, the physical layer. This can be exported directly from Power Factory. Once we have that, we can uh, automatically import this model in a database and store it in a JSON format. So we can easily then extend that. And once we have a full representation of the system in a database that for us is the only truth of source, basically, um, we can uh, automatically generate model for the real time simulators. In this case, you see that represented in uh, blue. And here uh, there is a representation of the uh, ephasor sim model that is um, um, the, the, the format that uh, uh, is used by OpalRT basically. The advantage of using OpalRT also in this case uh, related to the question that we got before is that uh, using the ephasor sim toolbox, uh, we can have uh, the definition of the grid in a tabular format. So um, this format can be easy, easily generated automatically from the database and uh, we can then uh, automatically deploy uh, this, uh, this code in the real time simulator. So until this point, basically uh, we have a way to represent, to properly represent the physical layer with all the electrical components. And this is done using the SIM model, uh, converting it to the one that I call it AIT uh, model at the end. So the, the AIT format, sorry. And, um, but we are still missing um, to model the interlayer communication. So how the application layer where our software controller or optimizer is running uh, with the physical layer. So usually, we get the application layer for free because this is the controller that uh, a user wants to test. So for that reason, uh, usually this uh, al uh, algorithm uh, is uh, encapsulated in a Docker image or it's containerized uh, with all the dependency in a container that then can be considered from us as a black box that will be then run in real time in our AAT servers. So this is kind of coming for, for free. We need just to represent in the database uh, the uh, Docker image to use and how the different components in the application layer interacts be between them. But basically, uh, the, the code is a, it's a black box. What we are still missing instead to define is the interlayer communication. So how these two layers interact together. So how to link the different sensors and actuators and how each uh, container in the application layer is mapped to a node in the grid basically. So how do we do that? This is using this diagram. Um, this diagram is giving you a high level overview 
um, of the implementation that we have. So here there are a few uh, key components. Um, but let me start describing what we see here. So on the left side, you see the physical layer. So in green, we have the different uh, components of the uh, electric grid, like load, buses, line, and so on. And on the right side, instead, we have a representation of the application layer. So for example, this uh, um, uh, black uh, uh, circle represents a controller, uh, or we can have, for example, a monitoring function. Once we have these two components, we need to link them together. So the first uh, component that we develop is the connectivity node. What is what is a connectivity node? A connectivity node um, is just saying that a specific component is exposing to the external world um, a measurement or set point type. So let's say, for example, here we have a controllable load. This controllable load can receive as input active power and reactive power set points. And on the other end, the controller has two connectivity nodes exposing some outputs for active power set points and reactive power set points. Once we have that, we can link two connectivity nodes together using a connection object. A connection object is basically um, uh, a representation of um, a link between two connectivity nodes. This is an abstract uh, representation. This is not telling us how the information is, chain, is exchanged between uh, two components. The uh, object that is actually uh, implementing the, has the has inside the, the, the physical implementation of how the information is exchanged is represented by a channel. So a channel uh, tell, tells us, for example, that this uh, active power set point is exchanged using a specific MQTT topic, uh, using uh, the broker running on a specific IP uh, address, and so on. At the same time, this can be not MQTT, but can be Redis or uh, Modbus or whatever protocol. So this is just a way to represent how uh, the, uh, how to link information between the application layer and the physical layer. So proceeding forward, um, here we have a um, schema of the database that we use to implement the previous diagram. So on the left side here, we have a uh, entity coming from the team model. So basically an entity representing a component uh, in the grid, like a load bus or what, or whatever and a function that represents uh, for example a control algorithm an optimizer or so on and uh, how do we link them together the first step is to uh, expose the connectivity node so we will have two connectivity nodes objects and each connectivity node object has a, a reference to the entity so in this case, the first one has a reference to the SIM entity and the second one has a reference to the uh, function entity. Once we have exposed the two connectivity nodes, then we can link them together with a connection object. The connection object um, has three different references. The first one is the reference to the first connectivity node, so ROM. And then there is the second uh, reference that is two the uh, second connectivity node in this case the one linked to the function and the third reference is to the channel the channel is the object that uh, basically basically represent the communication so the channel uh, keeps information like the redis or mqtt uh, key or topic uh, the name of the channel the type of the channel that can be uh, redis mqtt modbus uh, and also the uh, protocol. Uh, I didn't mention another component that we have here, and this is the connectivity node type. The connectivity node type is strictly linked to the connectivity node and basically represents additional metadata for the connectivity nodes. For example, 
to what kind of entity a connectivity node can be linked to, if the connectivity node is of type input and output, and some additional metadata information like descriptions or unit. And with that, we can basically represent uh, the interlayer communication. To, so to, sum to summarize a bit at this point, we managed to properly describe the physical layer using the same Steam uh, format plus the NGSILD format that is under the name AIT format. And uh, then we receive the controller to be tested as a black box in a Docker image. And then we have a way to represent the interlayer communication. And the good, the, the, the advantage of um, our framework is that we can uh, automatically import um, models and automatically generate all these uh, components and interfaces and links between uh, entities in two different layers. So the user the user is not involved in the uh, in the setup in this in this case. So there is no manual setup. Um, but uh, at this point, we don't have just uh, the tools for modeling. Uh, actually, um, we have much more uh, in our uh, framework. So the full software architecture is represented in this diagram because, as Katherine mentioned before, this is a really complex system. So multiple tools need to be uh, need to run uh, at the same time and need to interact between each other. So this diagram can look a bit intimidating at the beginning, but I will try to uh, follow the uh, the data flow, and uh, it will become clear how each what is the role of each component. I will start from the right side where uh, the user can input the grid model. Uh, the grid model is, for example, the the sim. Uh, uh, Use, uh, is the grid model in the sim format. So we have a grid, a grid model. We can automatically import this model in the database, and this can be done using the model importer module. Once we have uh, the model in the database, basically we have a representation of the physical layer. Um, what we are missing to do is to uh, describe the application layer and an eventual cyber layer on top of that, and also the interlayer communication. This can be done uh, using different strategies. The first one is uh, the user can log in to a front end, so a website, uh, log doing the login with uh, the, uh, the credential, and uh, once uh, the user uh, do do the login, then the user can interact with the Kronos API. We have specific APIs to interact with all the components in our software architecture, and the API are used also to configure the application and the cyber layer. So for example, uh, from the APIs, it's possible to expose some uh, connectivity nodes, create connection, link channels together, and so on. And later on, I will have a demo uh, where you can see all these steps done manually, basically. Um, once we have a full representation of the system in the database, we can then export the model uh, for the real-time simulator. So we can automatically generate, in our case, the phaser sim model. This is then shipped to the uh, OPALRT simulator, and we have a specific um, toolbox a specific component module that is used to interact with the real time simulator. The target, we call it target commander, but basically the target commander is a wrapper around the RTLab API. And with that, we can automatically create projects, uh, copy uh, the eFace or SIM model in the, in the correct folder, and then build, load, and execute a real-time simulation in OpalRT using the model that was exported from the database. In the real, in, um, with OpalRT, we use the phaser sim, as already mentioned, and then there is another uh, component running, the one that Catalin mentioned before, RoaDB, 
and this is used to exchange information between the AT servers and the real-time simulator using Redis. Redis is used as a in-memory cache database, but it's basically used as a cache for us. So it will keep just a snapshot of the uh, of the current uh, uh, model state, basically. And uh, in this way, all the other components in the uh, in the in our framework can uh, use these measurements. And I'm referring to that like the um, the uh, con um, controller that are running in real time. They are not represented there, but the controller will be deployed, and they will communicate with Redis getting information from here. In addition, we have two additional models. One is used to perform a test. What is a test? So a test is basically a sequence of events that we want to generate in the grid. So let's say, for example, that uh, we want to trip um, a line or we want to open a breaker or close a, a breaker in, in the grid. We can do that defining a sequence of events in the test runner. So for example, um, we will have a time equal 10, an event that closes a switch and so on. So we can uh, simulate different types of event in real time. And then we have a second um, module that is called experiment recorder. And this is basically recording all the signals from the simulation and storing it, storing them in a database. Once we have all the data in a database, then we can export the data and the user can analyze the data offline. In addition to all these models, we have also another way to interact with the uh, real-time uh, with the um, uh, real-time simulator and the uh, framework that we have. That is Pizel. Pizel is a um, a specific uh, programming language developed by a um, colleague of us, and uh, basically we can use scripting to automatically uh, define um, the uh, define and describe basically the interlayer communication and application layer. So basically how uh, information are exchanged between the different components. I will talk about uh, that a bit more later. OK, so in terms of workflow, uh, the question now is um, how does a module algorithm is integrator, integrated in the framework uh, that we have? And uh, what is the workflow to run a system level validation? Um, I start to divide that in three different steps. Uh, the first one is the configuration step where we define the cyber physical system and where we define the test to be run and the experiment. Once we have these configuration files, we can provide them as input to our framework and um, there is a, um, a phase where the model is generated, the interfaces are generated, and they are automatically deployed in OpalRT, so the real-time simulator, and on the AT server. And once we have this done, then we can run uh, real-time simulations using uh, different approaches, using, for example, scripting or integration with GitLab. We will see more la uh, later on and a, run a system level validation. Collect the result and then analyze them offline. So um, let me start with the um, configuration step. Uh, that is the first one. We can uh, define uh, the, uh, the interaction between the components in, uh, uh, in files and then using the API import these files and automatically generate the interfaces. And um, we can use PISA, that is this uh, advanced programming uh, language, specifically to, to uh, represent the application and the interface, uh, the interlayer communication layers. So I would say that for a beginner, maybe it's easier to um, manually, at the beginning, manually expose all the connectivity nodes, see how to link the different components together using the API, and this will be done in the demo later on. But for a more advanced user, uh, it is recommended maybe to use 
PISAL, where it's possible to automatize this process, basically. So um, we have um, APIs that are available at this link. Let's see if I can open them now. So to use the APIs, you need a login. But basically here you see that we have different sections that are used uh, for the interlayer communication, uh, for uh, defining experiment, test, uh, importing the model, for example, above here, and so on and so forth. So we have really a lot of APIs that are used to interact with the system and the user can use them, can use scripting to interact with them or can use PSAL. So uh, PSAL, uh, P-S-A-M-L, is a scripting language based on YAM, uh, YAM format, and this was developed by a colleague of us, uh, Philip Andren Prost. And uh, PISAL looks like something like that. So basically, we can um, define how um, different components are connected together in the uh, in the model, and uh, um, how to expose different pins, and how to link, uh, how to establish connection between uh, different connectivity nodes. So once the uh, configuration phase is done, we can move forward with the deployment. Um, and for the deployment, we need to have a Docker image for the controller algorithm. This will be deployed in the AT server. And at the same time, we will deploy the um, physical layer in the real-time simulators and also configure all the interfaces to make uh, these two components uh, talk to each other, basically. So the controller and the physical layer. And for the execution uh, of the simulation, uh, there are different ways to do that. So since the idea is to provide our framework as a service, um, there are different ways to interact with it. The first one is to use a more, let me call it manual process that involve the utilization of the API. Uh, so the user can um, configure the full uh, simulation using the API. So for, exam for example, uh, all the uh, interlayer communication and so on. And then for the execution, we can still use the API to, for example, create a new project in the real-time simulator, build the project, execute it, collect the data, specify which data will be recorded, and then manually, for example, stop uh, the simulation and download the data. Otherwise, there is also another possibility. We have integration with GitLab for who is familiar with GitLab CI CD, continuous integration, continuous uh, deployment. Um, the user can develop a new feature of the controller, do a new commit, and then automatically trigger um, a validation pipeline that will automatically build the Docker images. And these images will be shipped to the IT servers. And then we have dedicated validation pipeline uh, that are used to automatically take uh, the Docker images that are generated by the developer, deploy them, and at the same time deploy the real-time uh, the the model for the real-time simulation, execute the test, collect the data, and get back the result as form of artifacts in GitLab CI yeah, in GitLab in the GitLab um, graphical user interface. Okay, so at this point, I think it's time to move to the uh, to a demo. And for the demo, um, um, I'm using an edge-based distributed optimization. Uh, for the for the grid model, I use the IEEE 123 bus system. And the idea here is that um, at some nodes we have generation, so uh, changing uh, the generation. The local generation, we can 
minimize the line losses. So, so the objective of the uh, optimization is actually the power losses minimization, adjusting the local generation in the grid. Uh, this optimizer was developed, was developed by a colleague of us, Clemens Corner, and uh, using our framework, we validated it in real time. So the first step, and uh, now I will move to the video, but basically we will do the configuration using the API and the deployment uh, of uh, the physical, uh, uh, the grid basically, the physical layer and the application layer containing the uh, controller. Okay, so let me see if I can open uh, the video. Uh, one second. Okay, I should be able to see it. So the first step uh, is to export a model from uh, Power Factory. So in, in our case, we have a model in Power Factory. This is the uh, IEEE 120, uh, 123 bus uh, system model, and we export it from Power Factory to the same format. So here I'm basically exporting the model. And once we have a model, then we can use the, the API. Uh, so the Kronos API to import this SIM model um, in, uh, inside the database. So here I'm using the model uh, API. And here I need to specify the project ID that I know in advance, I already created a project. And here I specify also the target, the target is the real time simulator. But basically here I'm selecting the model that I just exported from Power Factory. And now I can import it. So this will run a process in the background. And what I can show you during the video is what is actually going on in the background. So all the different modules, how they run together. And here um, you can see that the model was imported. And after a few seconds, we get um, a log file, a message saying that the model was imported successfully. So here, uh, refreshing the database, we see that the model was imported uh, with all the components representing the physical layer. The next step now is to expose the connectivity nodes. Um, and the connectivity nodes are the one uh, representing, for example, the, the, the measurements that are exchanged, so like the active power, the active power, and so on. What we can do with the API is, first of all, query to know which, uh, um, which uh, connectivity nodes are available. In this case, the connectivity nodes type we can define, for example, some uh, filtering, like I want just the connectivity nodes that are for the lines, and I want the, uh, the ones that uh, are of type output. So here we get a list of all the connectivity nodes that are available for uh, the line, and then we can expose the connectivity nodes, basically. Here I previously copied the ID uh, of the connectivity node to expose, and here I can copy and paste the connectivity node and all the connectivity node for the lines are exposed basically in, during this step. I'm exposing in this case four different connectivity nodes for, uh, if I don't remember, uh, if I remember correctly, for voltage measurement, power line losses, uh, active and reactive power of the loads. So uh, this is what I did during this step. And then we can uh, proceed with the next step. That is the one uh, uh, basically creating all um, the function in the application layer and uh, all the interlayer communication uh, components. To do that, uh, I use scripting in this case. And let me see. Okay, this is the second part of the video. So here I have a bit of Python scripting that is using 
um, the API uh, to expose all the connectivity uh, nodes, all the connection, all creating all the channels. And basically we are proceeding step by step, creating all the different layers in the grid. This is what we are basically trying to do right now. This process takes a few seconds. And once we have um, a full representation of the model, we can proceed exporting that. But before doing that, I need to create uh, not only the connection, but also the, uh, mm, the channel. And to do that, I need to move uh, to part three, if I'm not wrong. Let me see. Yes. So basically, I need to jump a bit, sorry, uh, for the video. So here I'm exposing the, uh, the channel, so defining exactly where the information are exchanged. So for example, in this case, I'm using Redis. This takes a few seconds, but after a few seconds, we get a list of all the uh, channels that are exposed. Give it a few more seconds. So this process is not a one click process, but this will never be for a system level validation because it's a really complex uh, uh, model and a really complex task to do. So uh, the thing that we try to do here is to reduce a, a, at minimum the effort for the user and try to uh, automatize as, as possible the process. So maybe instead of taking two, three days, to do that manually, we can do that in a couple of hours. And also we can easily uh, do that for a grid that has 10 nodes or a grid that has 10,000 nodes because the process is basically the same. Instead, if the process is done manually, probably instead of taking two, three days, we need a month to configure like a very large system. Instead, with that, we can really horizontally scale uh, the simulation taking always the same time. At this point, um, I can export and generate the phasor sim model that we will be used by uh, Opalar T. So since now I have a full representation of the model in the grid, application layer, physical layer, interlayer communication, I have, a, I have all the components needed to generate a model for the real time simulator. And this is what is uh, going on in the background. These are the logs of the model uh, exporter module. And here you see that all the components are exported and then a file is generated. And here we get a successful message. Now I move to part uh, four. There are five parts. So yeah, you know in advance how many parts I have. And uh, at this point, I want to show you the file that, that is generated inside our server. So internally, uh, usually the user don't see that. It's just to give you an overview of what is happening here. So this network file is generated, and this is basically uh, the ephasor C model template that is populated using uh, the components of the grid that we use. So here you see all uh, the components. And the, mm, the advantage of using this framework is that all these ID are handled automatically. So if we want to like uh, change something, we can easily use the API to expose new uh, pin, uh, new connectivity nodes uh, or new measurements and we need just to re-export uh, re the model, build it and run it in real time. And this is really simple compared to changing signals manually as Catalin mentioned before. Okay, so at this point we can uh, start to interact with the, uh, with the real-time simulator and here there are dedicated API and we can, for example, um, build the project that we just exported. Of, of course, first we need to create it, but once that's done, we can uh, see on the real-time simulator the model was uh, created, was successfully created here, and now we can 
actually uh, start to build the model. Here I will send the command build the model, and this command takes a while because for who is familiar with the parity, probably if it's a large model, we need a couple of minutes. So I will uh, move forward. So here you see that the compilation started from a parity. We get the logs from a parity, and this process will take a bit. So let me jump. Here you see all the uh, the compilation steps that are run by Opality. And at the end, we will get a new uh, project in Opality. We can also add it to RTLab. The user don't see all of that. It's just I want to show you what is actually going on in the in the background. I know that I already said that, but I want to stress out on this point. OK, so now we see that we can uh, have the model in RTLab as well. This proved that the uh, export was, success was successful. And now I can move to part five of the video. Uh, that is this one. Wait one second. Uh, So here, the model was compiling. Uh, and after compiling, uh, maybe I can go back a bit. So maybe you cannot see it properly, but here the model was built successfully. So the compilation from OpalRT terminated, and we can proceed forward um, loading the model in OpalRT. This operation takes also a few seconds, so I will skip it. And after a few seconds, we will see that here the model is still loading. Um, and OK, so here the model was loaded successfully, so we can actually run it uh, in real time. And here we already received the command to run it. And you see also in RTLab that the model is running in real time. OK. So this was the first part of configuration and deployment. In this case, I decided to use the API to do the configuration instead of using uh, PSAL. And also the deployment was done using the API uh, building and loading the model in OpalRT. This, of course, can be done also automatically using the validation pipeline. And uh, but for this use case, I will skip the validation pipeline and I will jump to the last phase, that is the execution. And um, I will show you the model now running in real time. OK, so I have a last video that is one showing actually the model running. And let me open it. So now the, the objective is to validate the optimizer uh, to min minimize the, um, the line losses. So at this point, we have a model of the grid running. We have deployed also all the uh, uh, interfaces needed to for the communication between the optimizers the, and uh, the components in the grid. And here I prepare a very simple dashboard where we can monitor the total line losses, the total generation in the grid, and the total consumption in the grid. And what I want to show you is that I will like uh, reset uh, the system to a different set point, so the, the losses will increase, and then I will trigger the optimization, let it run for a few minutes, and uh, show you that the optimizer is basically reducing the total losses in the grid. So let's do that together. And in the background, we have all the signals that are exchanged between the Opalarty simulation and the, the AT servers. These, these are running here. Uh, we have the real-time simulations running, so 
you can see here also the execution time of the real time simulations. And at this point, uh, this is just a, a configuration that I have for the dashboard. And here I can reset and the model to a different set point and trigger the optimization. The optimization now it's running, but this takes a few minutes. So I will try to skip to the moment where we see the total losses uh, changing. Uh, let's see if I remember correctly. Should be around here. Almost. Okay. Let me go back a bit. Okay. So after a few minutes, the optimizer finalized uh, the computation and uh, defined new set points for the generators in the grid in such a way that the total line losses decreases. And this is what you can see here. If we wait a few more minutes, all the um, distributed controllers that are deployed uh, will uh, terminate. And after a few more seconds, we will see that the optimization is completed. And this basically end the demo. Um, oh, uh, I forgot to mention something. Uh, since, as I mentioned before, the um, Control the controller, or in this case, the optimizer, <coughs> is con is um, is basically a black box. It's a black box for us, and we just run it uh, as a Docker container in the background. And this Docker container was uh, communicating uh, with the uh, uh, with Redis to exchange signals. And basically, uh, in this way, we were able to to perform a system level validation. OK, um, so with the demo, we managed to do as first step the configuration, the deployment using the API, and as last step, the execution of the simulation. So to summarize, um, in the last years, we developed quite a lot of new features for the framework that we have this automated cyber physical testing and validation framework. Um, we have integration now with GitLab CI CD. So we can have validation pipelines to um, perform validation of system of large system. We have um, APIs to interact uh, with the system with the framework. The framework is really modular, as you saw. And in case new functionalities are needed, we can easily extend them, adding an additional module. It's possible to use scripting to interact with the system. Mm, we have a way to basically fast integrate a new controller and test them. Um, the replicability of the results is guaranteed because basically we can run the same simulation multiple and multiple times. and Basically, uh, we can also test uh, edge case scenarios that are not easy to uh, do uh, in the field. Um, the scalability um, is an, another important topic. So with this solution, we are able to simulate small grid, but also very large grid, because scaling the grid is effortless. So basically the same time of, of configuring a grid with 10 nodes is the same of configuring a grid with 10,000 nodes. And uh, under the hood, we use different technologies as Docker for containerization. And I would say that conclude my presentation. So I want to thank you and I will leave uh, time for questions. How are we time? Uh, uh, very good. Many thanks uh, to Kathleen and Dennis for the very nice insights and also for the demo uh, in the second part of the lecture today. There were already a couple of questions that have been uh, answered uh, in the chat. And additional information has been shared. Do we have uh, uh, additional comments, questions uh, from the audience? Oh, yeah, there's one from uh, Talha. Where is the uh, optimizer hosted? Is it something like controller in the loop? Uh, 
set up, I think in the last, uh, you mentioned the optimizer is hosted somewhere in a container, probably a Python script. Can you explain yes. uh, that in more detail? And it's yes. Um, so basically, since our framework is based on Docker, uh, once we have an a Docker image of the optimizer, in this case was developed in Python, uh, we can take this image and deploy it in Docker. And once this image is deployed in Docker, we can run it uh, in real time together with the real time simulator and have a use case where we test the optimizer as a secondary controller, for example, like an, op an optimizer. And uh, so basically, yes, the code, uh, I want to go back to uh, one previous slide that Kanta didn't present it. Uh, that is, let me see this one. This one. So basically, the, the optimizer is run in the AAT server as Docker container, while the grid model is emulated by Opalarty in real time. And these two systems run in real time exchange information. Thanks for the answer, Dennis. Are there any further comments, questions? Yes, how can we add other simulators to this framework, such as network simulators, NS3, or any other event based uh, to validate cyber physical systems? So, um, in principle, it's possible to add additional simula additional real time simulators, but for how the system architecture is done at the moment, we need to be able to interact with the uh, real time simulator in such a way that we can automatically generate uh, models for the real time simulators. So I'm thinking for the future. Let's say that instead of using one of the real time simulators that are available now in the market, it's possible to have a um, cluster of real time simulators, then this would be the optimal use case. So, for example, for the real time simulators that are available at the moment, I don't think it's really easy to add Typhoon or Plexbox because uh, from my knowledge, they don't provide a, a good way to automatically generate models. So it's difficult to come to, to go from the model representation that we have in the database to a model that can be run in the real time simulator. And this is why we choose a PALRT at that time, because it was the one that was more flexible. I don't know if this answers your question. Just ju jump in here, Dennis, because I think maybe you you uh, you didn't quite uh, got what uh, Tala was asking. He's asking about the uh, communication network simulation, like NS3. Uh, oh, okay. So so for that, just Tala to answer your question. So basically, we can in we can add additional tools to our framework as long as they offer some sort of API for model generation and some API to interact with the system as the system is running. So the same as we've wrapped the Opal RT with APIs to be able to interact the same. So NS3, I think, has uh, some nice Python uh, uh, libraries around it. It might be that it's even a, a Python package. I'm not. We So if you look at the cl um, Clemens's thesis that I linked in the chat, uh, he was using GNS3, which is basically the graphical user, in, uh, the graphical NS3, to to generate also the the communication uh, part, so to have the communication in the loop. We don't have that yet implemented. It's something that we are hoping to develop in uh, future projects, but it will fit exactly uh, on top of what is already here. So for example, all of this connection objects, channel objects and so on, will have additional properties from which we can then generate how we see the communication uh, simulator linked to the system. So, so in theory, as long as there is some interoperability to the tool, we can link it to, to our framework. 
Thanks for the answer. Okay. To Dennis and uh, Natalie. Uh, there's another question. How the Opal RT communicate with the AIT server and with uh, which protocol is being used? This is um, using RawDB, but since uh, Catalin developed it, I think it's better. Yeah. Uh, I, I think Mike uh, joined a bit uh, later the presentation. So um, basically, we we are using Redis to as the uh, data interface between uh, between the Opal RT and uh, our servers. One I second, think. I'm trying to open the slide. Uh, this one. Yeah, so basically this, uh, so we have this internal development called the uh, RoaDB, uh, which is this Redis Opal asynchronous data buffer. Basically it communicates via the shared memory interface that the Opal RT exposes uh, uh, with a Redis server, so yeah. Many thanks. Are there further comments, questions? It's not be the case, then I think uh, we are coming to an end. Uh, many thanks again to uh, Katalin and Dennis uh, for the, providing the lecture today, as well as to the other speakers uh, of the lectures uh, earlier uh, this week, uh, our colleague uh, Edmund Biedl, um, Philip Postel Andrein, as well as our colleagues um, from the Institute, uh, Mihao Pupin, um, Valentina Yanev, uh, Valentina Tinchenko, uh, Dea Elik, and um, Slavica Rakas. Many, many thanks. I uh, hope you enjoyed uh, the lecture series uh, during this week. Uh, as already said a couple of times, uh, we will summarize everything. Uh, we will uh, share the slides as well as the recordings later on uh, with all of you. Uh, it will take a few days uh, to put everything together to make it uh, or to provide it in a form that uh, is shareable uh, with all of you. Please be prepared uh, that you receive some messages uh, during the next few days. Many, many thanks. and. Uh, we can close uh, the lecture today and hope to see someone of you in some other activities. Thank you and goodbye. Yeah. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Bye.